on behalf of the American Red Cross and our International Humanitarian Law Program, welcome to Episode Zero of Masters of the Air, our Law of Armed Conflict Debrief. I'm Thomas Harper. I'm Senior Counsel for International Humanitarian Law here at the American Red Cross's National Headquarters in Washington, D.C. It's my pleasure to be your guide on this very nerdy journey. For part zero, I want to start by congratulating you because whether you realize that or not clicking on this video, you're now a part of the U.S. Army Air Force circa 1943. And I'm really excited to tell you that you've been assigned alongside me to the 100th Bomb Group, the stars of Masters of the Air and just a legendary unit in World War II history. In particular, I'm excited because you're going to be part of a B-17 Flying Fortress crew an absolute powerhouse, a juggernaut, and a central part of the U.S. bombing efforts during World War II, our air campaign over Europe. And one of the fascinating things about Masters of the Air is we get to see a peek behind the curtain at what it was like for the crews, for the pilots of the B-17s outside of just their time on mission in the air. And that includes things like intelligence briefings. And one item that I'm really upset that got left on the cutting room floor, but we're making up for here, is the legal briefing. Because as a crew member of the B-17 Flying Fortress, you've got to know the legal issues you're running into or flying into for each mission. So I'm going to serve as your guide for those legal issues uh, and, and consider this just a deleted scene for each of these episodes. If the creators knew what they were doing, uh, they know what the audience wants. They put some legal drama in this as well. If you're anything like me, you're watching the episodes and you're like Rick Dalton here, spotting legal issues left and right. And if not, that's okay, because you've got me as your guide, me as your briefer. And we're going to go through these things, hopefully to help you better understand how these laws work, but also to give you an opportunity to go back, watch these episodes again with a fresh view on things and a new perspective. So it's just another excuse to watch the show again. Now, you might be sitting there like Buck and Bucky here, the sound or the thought of a lawyer uh, leading you through uh, legal issues in a TV show, uh, that sounds like a recipe for absolute disaster. We're going to bring this plane in each episode smoothly, and I can assure you uh, that we will make it through together. The first question you might have as you're looking at this against the TV series is why are there even rules in warfare? This question comes up all the time. It is a question that has been ever present ever since the first rules for armed conflict were applied, and it, it persists. And especially in the context of Masters of the Air, you might be thinking, why are you applying rules uh, that, that somehow constrain the act of war, what do you do in war when you're talking about fighting an enemy as evil as the Nazis, as evil as Hitler and his henchmen? Wouldn't it make sense to go gloves off and just fight this conflict by any means necessary to defeat an enemy like that? And I submit to you that outside of any legal jargon or citations to treaties or laws, these laws and this sort of framework matters for a number of reasons, and it matters to a number of people that we see throughout the series so far. It matters to these British citizens, the folks who are watching the B-17s from the 100th Bomb Group come in during the first episode, uh, civilians who live close enough to the airfield that they can walk onto the airstrip, greet the crews as they arrive uh, in country there. And they're living in a country that is actively exposed to attacks by Germany. Certainly it matters for those civilians. It matters for the air crews that are up flying these dangerous missions. They're coming under heavy fire. They're coming up against waves of Luftwaffe fighters. And so whether they're in the, uh, in the aircraft or uh, abandoning ship and parachuting to the ground over Europe, those air crews have a real keen interest in how those rules operate as well and what protections they might offer uh, those air crews. And then lastly, the folks on the ground uh, that are on the receiving end of these bombs or maybe in the vicinity of these bombing runs, the rules matter to them as well. And that has nothing to do with a, an outlook on, on Germany or the Axis powers or uh, there's no 
politics in, embedded in that statement. But these rules are in place for reasons of humanity. Uh, so it, it applies universally, regardless of who you are, what side you're fighting for, uh, the reasons that you're fighting. And so these rules apply or they, they matter to just about everyone you see or, or are implicated in every episode. And so it's a fair question to ask international humanitarian law. What is it? It sounds like maybe delivering water bottles or humanitarian aid. Maybe are we talking convoys, you know, Red Cross ambulances, that sort of thing. It's a fair question. IHL for short is synonymous with the law of war. It's synonymous with the law of armed conflict. All of those terms are interchangeable. International humanitarian law is just what the international community refers to this as. So it's the most common terminology used. And it's way broader than sort of human rights law. IHRL is, is its own body of law uh, that we won't cover here. But IHL is a body of international law or a subset of international law is at its broadest level, a set of rules that are meant to reduce suffering during armed conflict. These rules for humanitarian purposes, uh, in other words, the the uh, keeping the interest of humanity in mind, exist to try to rein in the traditionally destructive effects of war. And it's important before we go into any issues in Masters of the Air to get a snapshot of what IHL was like. What was the state of the law in 1943 when this series began? Because the rules that were in play at the time were critical. It's it's not really useful to take modern day uh, IHL, the body of law we have today in 2024, as I record this, and try to apply them to a conflict uh, in which many of these rules didn't exist. So when we talk, think IHL or the law of war, the Geneva Conventions are really often the, the first thing we think of. And so we think of GC one through four. So the most famous of the Geneva Conventions, there's more than one, if you didn't know that. Uh, but these sort of famous treaties didn't come around until 1949. These were a product of post-war uh, global efforts to recognize the destruction of World War II and try to come together to provide better protection for future armed conflicts and, and in, in so doing, reduce further uh, human suffering. So in 1943, when the 100th reached Europe, you didn't have GCs one through four, but there were Geneva Conventions in existence. You had three mainstays that are shown here. You had the original, uh, the original GC1, which is no longer referred to, to it by that name, but uh, it concerned the treatment of battlefield casualties. In 1906, you had a new GC for wounded armies in the field. And then in 1929, on the heels of World War I, you had a GC on concerning prisoners of war. So you also had another major set of treaties which is that of the Hague Conventions. So your two main Hague Conventions, 1899 and 1907, are still considered good law today, even though they're quite old. Uh, but this was the second sort of main line of treaty law. But those sort of written laws weren't the, ex you know, the sole extent of IHL. Each military, including the U.S. military, had its own practice and procedures. So IHL has this really interesting vein called custom or customary international law. The idea that a rule or a, a, a restriction might not be written in a treaty, it might not be adopted uh, you know, and signed onto by countries, but countries have tendencies. They have practices or uh, regulations that they often abide by, and over time, and as these practices repeat over and over and over again, that military practice, that repetitive military practice, starts to take the weight of law. And so you had military manuals, including the, the U.S. or the, the War Department, the, the eventual DOD, or the precursor to the Department of Defense, 
they had a manual on the rules of land warfare. So this picture here, FM Field Manual 27-10, this was in existence in 1943. And I guarantee you this was issued to, if not the, the bomber crews or some of the officers, it was certainly issued to those who would have been giving legal briefings, who would have been in uh, consulting on these operations. So this overlays the treaties that were in place at the time. And it's it's sort of the the in this case, the U.S. military's own set of rules that they ascribe to, regardless of what other parties uh, are concerned with. So that just sets the table for our future episodes. We're going to roll up our sleeves and really dig into specific legal issues starting in our next episode. And we're going to start with part one of Masters of the Air. We're going to tackle everything from uh, poor Harry Crosby and his unfortunate navigation error as they try to get to England for the first time and end up over France, greeted with lots of flack. We're going to talk about the major mission that is the centerpiece of part one, which is the bombing raid on the U-boat pens at Bremen. And within that, we're going to take a look at the issues that cropped up on that mission, specifically weather-related issues with regard to cloud cover and how that impacted things. So thanks for tuning in. We hope to see you next episode. We're keeping these episodes nice and, and short in comparison to our traditional webinars. If you want to learn more about our efforts, you can go to this QR code. You can go to our website on redcross.org, find out about the things we have going on, learn more about IHL, find out about volunteer opportunities in your area, and always uh, like and subscribe so that you're able to keep up with these future releases.